On a day like today, it's hard to imagine the White Mountains of New Hampshire holding the title of worst weather in the world. You can see for 90 miles up here. Hi, I'm John Veeman. They say it can snow any month of the year in these mountains, that violent thunderstorms come with little or no warning, and that the hurricane force winds aren't the exception, but the rule. So keep your fingers crossed as we make our own adventure hiking above treeline on Trailside. Believe it or not, this is the famous Appalachian Trail. On its way from Georgia to Maine, it runs right through the visitor center here at Pinkham Notch, New Hampshire. Now we'll be crossing the AT again, only at 3,500 feet higher up above treeline. The center is a great place to start and end a hiking trip around here. It has lodging, hot meals, showers, information, and even a special way to check on the weather, not just down here, but up on top. Mount Washington, Mount Jefferson, Mount Adams, Mount Madison. This is the Presidential Range in the White Mountain National Forest. And for hikers here, weather is a prime concern. You don't want to get caught above tree line in a blizzard or an electrical storm. So before we take off, I thought I'd check out this weather computer and see what conditions are like at the top of the tallest one, Mount Washington. Let's see. We've got temperature of 34 degrees, wind speed of woo, 46 miles an hour, and overcast skies. Sounds like I better get on some warmer clothes. We're meeting up with Joe Lentini. He teaches climbing here in the Whites, and currently he's the Vice President of the New Hampshire Mountain Rescue Services, where he's also been a member for 18 years. Hey Joe, what are you doing? Well, I'm just looking at this trillium. What is it? This is one of the flowers that comes out around here in the spring. Oh, they're really beautiful. You know, it's spring down here, but I bet it really gets cold up on top, huh? Oh, it'll be a good 20 degrees colder where we're going. We'll lose five degrees per thousand feet of elevation. And that's why the big pack. Lots of extra food, and clothing, even crampons and ice axe. Yeah, you're really loaded for bear. Well, Joe and I are in lightweight clothes right now, but they serve an important purpose. They're made of synthetics so that if we get wet from sweat or rain, they'll wick moisture away from our body. If we were in damp clothes, say cotton for instance, and we got blasted by some cold, our body temperatures would really drop. That's why I don't have a natural fiber on my body. Yeah, is this where we're headed? Yeah, this is the line we've been looking at, the one we talked about the other night. Sure. We'll be coming right up here mm -hmm. and actually camping right below tree line and probably heading up over the summit tomorrow morning. Now you've got some alternate routes to in case we run into bad weather and stuff like that? Yeah, we have a couple of good bailout routes on either side in case the weather turns on us. Yeah, you told somebody where we're going? Yeah, I left my itinerary with my wife. She knows what time we're supposed to be down. It's probably still a good idea not to be too married to our plan and stay flexible though, huh? Absolutely. I'm glad we stuck with that route because uh, I might be bumping into some friends up here. Well, what I'm looking forward to is getting away from the sound of that highway. Yeah, that's one of the nice things about leaving the trailhead. Uh-oh, trail's blocked. Gonna have to go back. What is it, a blowdown? Yeah, just something came down this winter. Volunteers will get it soon. We're gonna be careful to go over these, not around them. We don't want to be starting any new trails. Yeah. Hey, well, speaking of volunteers, we ought to be running into those friends of mine I was telling you about earlier. Well, one of the ways I put something back into the outdoors for the many hours of enjoyment I get out of it is to serve as chairman for the American Hiking Society. Among its many programs, AHS acts as a national clearinghouse for people who want to volunteer for trail work. Each year, 
thousands of people from all walks of life are pitching in. Now when people contact AHS, we put them in touch with someone like Ruben Rajula, who's made a career out of helping others help out. Well, it looks like you got a little spring maintenance here, huh? Oh, for sure. These guys are removing the winter blowdown. Uh -huh. This is Joe. Hi, Joe. Hey, how are you today? Good. Now, how did you find out about this? Through the American Hiking Society volunteers. Was it hard to talk you into coming out? No, just a phone call and I came along to work on the trails for them. I've been hiking these trails for 45 years and it's a chance to put something back in. Oh, well, you're doing some nice work. I'll let you get back to it. Thank you. Now, what's going on down here? They're preparing a log for a water bark. Mm -hmm. Well, they're stripping the bark off it. Now, why do they do that? Well, by taking the bark off, the log will last a little bit longer. It doesn't rot away quite as quickly. Mm -hmm. This is Linda. Hi, Linda. Hi. Now, how did you get involved with this? Well, I used to think there wasn't a lot that I'd be able to do on a volunteer vacation, but there's so many jobs to do that just about anybody can pitch in and help, and it's, yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, you look like you're having some fun. I'll let you get back to that. You'll be installing the water bar a little further down the trail, so you'll see what that's all about. Okay. Looks like we got some rock work here, and you even, you even got Joe into the act. Oh, yeah. They're finishing off a stone staircase. This is Lou. Hi, Lou. Hey, John. Now, why are you putting a stone staircase in right here? Well, you can see that this uh, root is rather a lar it's a large drop-off from the root down to the trail tread, and uh -huh. we thought we'd put some steps in to help out the backpackers and solve an erosion problem right below as well. well it looks like a pretty good-sized rock you're moving in there. So you ready? Try it out. Real solid. It's going to last for a long time, I'm sure. Well, it looks great. This is a water bar, an existing one. Uh, one of the most important things on a trail is to get good drainage. Uh -huh. So we're taking the water off to the left and down this ditch uh -huh. to another water bar that we're installing down below. So this will just make sure there is no water really on the trail bed, huh? That's right. We'll take it off right here and uh, Matt's finishing off the trench for the log. Hi, Matt. Hi. Well, you look pretty young to be out here. How did you find out about this? Well, I work for the Student Conservation Association, do a lot of trail building and trail maintenance. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to spend the summer, I'll bet. Oh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Oh, here, watch out. Here comes, a, here comes our water bar. Quite a bit of team effort involved oh, here, huh? for sure. Looks great. Yeah, well, you look like you're doing some nice work, Reuben. We keep trying. Look at this, the rock version of that water bar. It's doing a great job channeling the water off the trail. Sure getting steep. Well, you know, after looking at the map, a lot of people underestimate the time on the trail. You gotta give yourself a good half an hour for every mile, then add another hour for every thousand feet of elevation gain. Yeah, it's not always a case of the shortest line being the fastest way to get there, huh? Well, that all depends on how hard you want to work. Looks like we got some more volunteer work here. Yeah, good job. These ladders make short work, don't they? We're nearly two-thirds of the way up the mountain. The tree line is just ahead, and our destination is Mount Adams, nearly 5,800 feet. Now, it's against regulations to camp above the tree line. The tundra in the alpine zone is extremely sensitive to human traffic, so we're going to camp down here. And tomorrow, if the weather cooperates, It's getting cold out, huh? Yeah, it looks like we get a little snow, too. When do you say we start looking for a place to pitch a tent and quick, huh? Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, I'll bet you see a lot of hypothermia in these mountains. Well, you know, today's a really good example. You know, it's nice and warm when we started, but as we gained altitude, temperature dropped. Reminds me of a day last summer. People all over the mountains. Cold front came in, kicked up some showers. 
Next thing you knew, there were a good 30 people up high with hypothermia. Most people don't realize that it doesn't have to be below freezing to worry about hypothermia. No, your body only has to lose two degrees of temperature to make it dangerous. People have to remember to bring lots of extra clothes for any conditions. Besides extra clothes, we're carrying extra food and water. Your body needs the fuel to generate warmth, so it's a good hedge against hypothermia. And just in case Joe and I get separated in a fog or storm, we're both carrying maps marked with water and shelter locations, and one of these, a whistle. Joe, you there? Love this summer weather. Yeah, typical for the mountains. Started out in shorts and here I am, dressed for winter. You know, a few hours when it gets dark, it's gonna even get colder. This looks like a good site. This is the best flat site I've seen. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Why don't you get the tent out and we'll stake it out and see if it fits in this area. Well, once you found a good level spot for your tent that's far enough back from the trail, and the regulations here say 200 feet, you try not to disturb it too much. Now I'm going to pick up a few sticks just so they don't poke their way into the tent. But otherwise the rule is leave no trace camping. And that means pack out what you bring in and leave the place the way you found it. Let's see if it fits. To see if a tent really fits in a tight spot, you may have to stretch it out to its full dimension and put in a few stakes. And if it's windy, that may be a good idea anyway, since it'll keep everything from flapping around. This is a rain flying. It goes over the entire tent. It's separated from it by the superstructure of the tent poles. Now its purpose is to keep rain out of the tent while still allowing for adequate ventilation. But to make it work well, you want to make sure it's pulled out and guide tight so that it never touches the tent walls, otherwise your tent's going to leak. Here you go, John. Thank you. Well, this is a four-season tent, which means it can be used year-round. It's got a nice rounded shape, so it'll shed lots of snow. Good thing we brought it. <laughs> uh, or, three guys hiking up Mount Washington wind up wandering miles down the Crawford's Path in the woods. How'd they save themselves? They had money. They lit their money on fire to start a fire. And one of the guys actually commented that, you know, credit cards don't burn very well. Oh, no. Coffee? Sure. Doesn't look like we're going anywhere soon, huh? No, I don't think so. I can't believe it snowed up here, huh? Well, these are the White Mountains. Yeah. Well, the weather's looking a little raw out there, so we're going to sit tight and enjoy a nice leisurely breakfast. Fortunately, this tent has a vestibule, which works great to protect our cooking. You never want to bring a stove into the main tent compartment. Gas fumes and flames are the obvious hazards. Cooking in the doorway is fine, but I'm sitting here ready to kick the stove out just in case there's any problems. While we're stuck here, why not join me on a recent visit I took to nearby Mount Washington? On its summit is a nationally renowned weather station that keeps track of just how extreme the weather gets around here. I think it was Mark Twain who said, if you don't like the weather, well, just wait a while. And that couldn't apply anywhere better than it does right here. We're at the summit of the highest mountain in the northeastern United States, 6,288 feet. Now that's not very high by western standards, but because Mount Washington is situated at the intersection of two major storm tracks, it's home to some of the worst weather in the world. Hurricane force winds are recorded more than 100 days each year right where we're standing. Now inside the weather station is meteorologist Dave Thurlow, a guy who gets paid to sit in the eye of the storms. Hey Dave. Oh, hi there, John. Welcome to the Mount Washington Observatory. Nice to be here, but you know, I was looking at these dials, and this looks like something you'd see in a museum more than a science laboratory. Well, they probably could be in a museum. They're well over 30 years old, and though it's very low-tech and old-tech, it's still very accurate, so we keep it. Mm -hmm. Now, what's this over here in the case? 
Over here we have what's called a mercury barometer, the very long column of mercury actually mm -hmm. measures the weight of the atmosphere, the, or the air pressure as it's called. And what's the air pressure up here? Up here in general, the air is a lot less heavy. In other words, it's thin air, so we are a lot lower air pressure up here on the summit. Hmm. And this dial over here, now what's this measuring? Wind speed or something? Yeah, right here, this is uh, the wind speed, the history of the wind today, and it looks like we've been averaging about 35 or 36 miles an hour today. Probably not very exciting for you guys, though, huh? No, it's a pretty typical day, but uh, we'd like to see something a little more exciting. And you, you can compare today's trace to this one here, in which we had a peak gust of 182 miles an hour. In fact, the needle went right off the chart. Look at this. That's well, you incredible. better tie the buildings down at speeds like that, huh? Well, you certainly do. Um, the, and as a matter of fact, the world record wind that was recorded here on the summit in 1934, 231 miles an hour, oh. was recorded in a building that's outside. It has since then been chained to the ground. So pretty <laughs> remarkable wind speeds. Now, what else do you have outside to look at? Outside, we have the thermometers. We can go out and read the temperature out there. And this is it? Yeah, this is it. This is all there is to it. The official National Weather Service thermometer. And what do we have for a temperature today? Right now we have a temperature of uh, balmy 40.4 degrees. Huh. And why is it in this box? This box, as you can see, is ventilated to allow the air to move by the thermometer and also to protect it from the sunshine so the reading is accurate. If it's 44 degrees up here, why are we having ice that's forming? This ice formed here last night when it was below freezing and cloudy uh -huh. and uh, this is called rime ice and it's actually cloud droplets droplets of water that freeze on contact and these little arrows kind of point right into the wind Amazing. so this is 36 miles per hour wind huh well this is 36 it might be gusting a little bit higher than that maybe up to about 45. oh not too bad though i need to see what it's like when it's 100 miles an hour up here well, if it was 100 miles an hour, you could join our Century Club. We have a club where when we do have sustained winds of 100 miles an hour, you can walk all the way around this deck. And if you do it without falling down, you become a member of the Century Club. So what are some other observations you'd make up here? Well, the most basic observation we'd make is looking at the sky and uh, sizing up the clouds and uh, what kind of clouds and how high they are. What do you see? Today I see clouds that are dissipating. These clouds will disappear as the sun goes down, these cumulus clouds, and they're not showing a whole lot of other clouds above it, so I see some reasonably good weather for the next 12 or so hours anyway. Okay, well I'll be backpacking in the next few days, so I'll see how good you are at forecasting. Well, you know what they say, you don't like the weather. Yeah, I've heard that one. <laughs> Looks like we're coming in above tree line, huh? Well, the trees around us are eight feet or less, so technically we are above tree line. This is only 4,200 feet. How come tree line is so much lower out here in the east than it is out west? Well, it's really not a function of altitude here. It's a function of the harsh weather that we get. In these exposed areas, the winds just howl through, and that's what causes these trees to grow like this. Well, this one's pretty stunted right here. What's going on? This is, we'd call this crumb and this is a tree that's been really twisted by the winds. You can see how the snowpack probably covered the lower part of this tree. Anything that's stuck up above the snow, though, is killed. The yeah. wind scoured it clean. Look at that. Yeah. This is some more of the same stuff over here? Yeah, exactly. But look at this tree closely because the tree itself looks dead, but it's actually just the branches that were facing out into the wind that are dead. Uh -huh. The wind pushed all the trees back here. You can see how it formed this area. But right in here, the few branches that did stick out, probably above the snow, are scoured clean, including all the branches that would be facing into the wind. Now, where'd the term Krumholz come from? Oh, it's a German word for twisted wood. The plant life really thins out up here, doesn't it? Yeah, even the Krumholz is disappearing, but look at this. This is lichen. It's a cross between algae and fungus. It grows on the rocks. You can see, Right here, it's completely dried out, but it'll survive even in, if it's totally saturated with water. Now, is it okay to step on it? Well, it grows on all the rocks. We really can't avoid it. Just stay on the trail. Okay. Oh, this is what I've been hoping for. Diapensias beginning to bloom. Die what? Diapensia, this is my favorite flower. You can see. It's really hardy, mm -hmm. survives 100 mile an hour winds, 40 below temperatures, but see this dead spot right here? Yeah. It's probably a human footprint. That it can't withstand. 
Well, they've got pretty flowers. How long do they flower for? Oh, depending on where you are, it's about a three-week time frame. I suppose you got to watch where you put your trekking poles around here too, huh? Yeah, just stay on the trail, stay on the rocks. I really love it when we get high enough up here, our view opens up in all directions. Good news is we can see what the weather's doing. Bad news is, if it turns on us, there isn't any shelter in sight. Yeah, we better keep an eye on these cumulus clouds too. They look like they might be generating a little weather in a while. Well, that rain really came on quick, didn't it? Yeah, but I hope it's just gonna be a passing shower. Yeah. Well, these cairns are really well made up here, marking the trail. Who do you think put them up? Well, originally it was just volunteers, but now it's a combination of volunteers and the National Forest Service. Oh, they must have a pretty healthy trail adopters program, you know, where people adopt a favorite section of their trail. Yeah, a number of clubs in the area belong to that. You know, every once in a while, when I'm going by one of these where something's falling off, I like to pick it up. Put it back in place. Good idea. Looks like it's clearing off nicely. Well, this looks like Thunderstorm Junction. Yeah, that's what the big cairn here marks. Six trails intersect here, including the Appalachian Trail. Well, you know, this is the longest section of the AT above tree line, about 12 miles. That's the AT right there. That's what those cairns mark. Now, why are they so close together? Well, you know, if the weather closes in on us, we need them that close together so we can see from one to the other, see where we're going. You know, sometimes during the winter, I'll actually carry a piece of rope with me, so if the wind starts blowing, we can one of us stand at the cairn and the other one sort of heads out and tries to find the next one. I hate to ask this, but why do they call this Thunderstorm Junction? Well, if you look around here, it's pretty open and the weather funnels right through this section of the mountains. It can get pretty violent around here. So what if we did get caught in a thunderstorm up here? Well, I get down below tree line really fast. Yeah, but what if you couldn't get down? Well, I get away from those rocks we just came down. I get down here, a little bit out in the open get my pack off to reduce my body size. I get one of our insulated foam sleeping pads out, put it on the ground, and I stand on it and the balls of my feet crouch down really low. Well, if the idea is to get really low, why wouldn't you just sprawl out on the rocks? Well, I want to reduce my contact area, and I, want to be, I don't want to be grounded. Huh? Hey, by the way, uh, you want to hold these metal poles? Yeah, yeah right. In a thunderstorm, I'd be as far away from those metal poles as I possibly could be. Now, how would you know whether to go down below tree line or to just go for some cover right here? Well, I'd count from the lightning flash to the thunder for every five seconds we have about a mile. If it gets right on top of us, you'd know it. Your hair may start to stand on end. Adams, huh? Yeah, this is second highest in the presidentials. How about we go down here and take a break out of the wind a little bit? You know, this, these rock formations here almost make it look lunar. Well, you know, it's the constant freezing and thawing up here that break these rocks up. Also, it gives this place about the same growing season as the moon. If you look over there, there's Mount Madison. And straight across, you know, there's Mount Washington. That's the highest of the presidentials. And yeah, over there to the right a little more, that's Mount Jefferson. I think I'm going to take a water break. Well, I bet you don't get many days like this up here, huh? No, they're few and far between. Well, we got our day, and that means one spectacular view. Up here, you have to learn to let the mountains call the shots and be ready to roll with the punches. Just looking at those thunderheads over there, they're telling us we don't have a whole lot of time to dawdle, so we're going to head on down. We'll see you next time on Trailside. Hey, Joe, what do you say we go have a high-level summit meeting with President Jefferson over there? 
Is that supposed to be a pun? Yeah. Hey, what's the order now, anyway? Well, you know, I think Washington was the first president, but it could have been either Adams or Jefferson that was second. I'm really not sure. Love this summer weather. Yeah, typical for the mountains. Started out in shorts and here I am, dressed for winter. Right do this now, wild track right here and okay. rolling. You want me to be walking? 52, take two. And action! inside the cassette. It's having babies. 10,000 ladies tomorrow morning. Just a little bug in the system. I saw Apparently, the uh, bugs are not of the uh, new MA metal stock. This ladybug is not indigenous to New Hampshire, I'm trying to say. This is a Japanese well, how could it have survived infiltrator. In there I always enjoy the prospect of hiking in the White Mountains, even though I've had my share of bad weather trips there. And on this episode of Trailside, we also received our share of weather. In the course of our shooting day, it wasn't uncommon to experience everything from fog to rain to sleet to snow to sun tanning heat, and never in that particular order either. The Whites earn their reputation for the worst weather in the world. This particular stretch of trail up to Mount Adams is very typical of what you'll find throughout the area. One nice feature are the huts maintained by the various hiking clubs, the Appalachian Mountain Club and Randolph Mountain Club among them. For a small fee, you can unroll your sleeping bag in a dry shelter above tree line. The huts also help concentrate the use to minimize the human impact upon this fragile area. Beyond the location itself, the highlight of this episode for me was meeting up with the trail maintenance crew. As I mentioned on the show, I donate a big part of my free time to the American Hiking Society, which sponsors dozens of trail crews throughout the country. On this show, I had my first tour of the Mount Washington Weather Observatory. It's a well-known institution to anyone in the Northeast since it's situated in the crux of most storm fronts moving in and out. I've always wondered what kind of life it must be to sit on the top of the Northeast's highest mountain in near seclusion most of the winter except for a few recording instruments to remind you that there's still a world out there. In truth, the crew accommodations are far from the frigid one-room outpost I had envisioned. I wasn't aware that the weather station is a self-supporting private enterprise, or more like a club. Still, this is one club where you have to enjoy spending time with the other members. We were lucky in the White Mountains. For a place that claims to have the worst weather in the world, about 300 days in the clouds, I had a view that I'll remember for a long time. When a shoulder is dislocated, the victim will hold 
their shoulder away from their body. If they'd had a broken bone here or up here, they'd hold it against their body to keep it from moving. Mm -hmm. But a dislocated shoulder, because they had bones over here, makes them hold it away from themselves. Now, you can treat this if it happens to yourself immediately if you grab your wrist and pull straight forward. That'll pull that bone back in place. But if it lasts more than five minutes out of the socket, the spasm and pain become horrible, and you'd never be able to bring it in with that method. I can show you a method, though, that you could use. And for that, I've set up a little demonstration area here. If I could have you just lay down here, sure. I'll show you this technique. The technique we're using actually uses gravity. And gravity is a nice, gentle pull. For that reason, there's very little pain associated with it. Get the patient comfortable. Be sure you pat them if it's a sharp area. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to attach a 10-pound weight to their forearm. Mm -hmm. In this case, I have this bucket, but I'll tell you what. You could use a, a pair of pants, a day pack, anything that you could tie to the forearm. You wouldn't be able to hold this. You're going to have to tie it on because you need to relax your muscle as much as possible. You can just let it float right back just, into the socket. That's right. It'll just gradually pull and pull that bone back into the socket. This uh, might take 20 minutes, maybe longer, but during that time, it gives you a chance to basically protect the patient from the environment and to uh, make things more uh, accessible around camp to getting them out later. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a fairly treatable injury in the field, and it's not going to mean the difference of abandoning the expedition, but what if you do have an injury that's more serious where you have to be evacuated? What well, would you do? Sure, if you don't put a position, this back in position, this would be a terrible injury in the field, but you get it back in, they're functional, they can get out on their own, but you might run into injuries where you simply cannot do the definitive care, where you need to evacuate the patient. One aspect of your medical care is an evacuation plan. What kind of food do you eat on long climbs like this one? I tell you, John, anything and everything. It's really important to try and keep up with all of the calories that you'll be burning on the upper mountain. Well, what about like freeze-dried foods? Do you bring those? Freeze-dried works. I tend to like to bring food that appeals to me down below on the upper mountain. How about like a burrito or something? Yeah, that's good, Terry. A burrito will work. Keep in mind there's no microwaves out there, so you're going to have to eat that thing cold. Well, do you do anything special the night before, like carbo load or anything like that? Carbo loading is a good thing to do. Um, in fact, very similar to running a race. Terry, you're a marathoner. How do you prepare? I always go wild wow, with spaghetti the night before a race. You bet. I think that's a great thing to do. In addition to that, I'd suggest pushing fluids. Uh, it's really important to hydrate on the upper mountain. I'll drink quite a bit the night before, maybe four or five glasses of water, and that'll help me tomorrow when there's not that much water available. like our chicky coming up. That's how you say it, isn't it? Chicky? Chicky, that's right. Chicky's a Seminole word, means dwelling. Uh -huh. And the Seminoles started using these when they first came to Florida. They were living out in the grasslands and they needed some place to get themselves up out of the water because mm -hmm. it'd flood a lot. Yeah. And so they came up with this chicky idea and the park service has found it to be a perfect adaptation for out here in the 10,000 Islands. You get the feeling of being surrounded by the mangroves, but you don't have some of the disadvantages, like you're pretty coon-proof and you don't have many bugs and you also minimize the human impact. How many chickies are there in the park? It's about 12 of them. Most of them nowadays are the double kind like this, but a lot of the older ones are just a single chickie, single platform. Mm -hmm. This one's the deluxe model. It's even got an outhouse. Yeah. They got a, a boat called the Honey Barge that comes and pumps these things out. I hope it's been here recently. Yeah. This is nice. This is nice. Yeah. Now, this is the same design that the Seminoles would have, he would have used, or is this Well, different? roughly. The, the, the Seminoles would have built theirs out of cypress logs uh -huh. instead of this 4x4. Four four. Yeah. You know, cypress is their abundant wood, and it's really rot resistant, so it's mm -hmm. perfect for them. And they'd skin off the bark to keep bugs from crawling up into the roof. Right, right. Now, the, the roof itself, would it be flat or would it be more of a peaked roof? To They'd have a peaked to... roof, and that would, it was made out of thatched palmetto fronds, mm -hmm. and that would let the water run off real good. Okay. Real waterproof, real uh, cool in the summertime because it had a lot of thermal protection they'd, there. They'd leave the walls open like this year-round? The walls would be open. They'd usually have some kind of a windscreen that they could put up. Mm -hmm. And up under the peaked roof, up under the rafters, they'd have like loft built in there, and that's where they'd put a lot of their personal possessions to keep them real dry. 
This is nice. We've got a place for cooking. We've got some cleats down here for tying the tents down at night. Yep, all the comforts of home. Most people are skeptical when I say I make pizza in the woods. But you know, you really can make just about anything out here that you can in your oven at home. My secret for pizza is a convection oven. Now, it's a little extra weight, but it's awful nice to have that kind of a reward waiting for you at the end of a long day. You'll need a lightweight stove with some good flame control. Now, the oven itself comes with a diffuser plate and a base that also doubles as your camp skillet and a lid. Well, it's actually an idiot-proof lid because it has a temperature knob that has, doesn't have numbers, but it has warm up, bake, and burn. But the real key piece is the convection dome. It's made out of aluminized fiberglass and sets right on top and really concentrates the heat. Now, to whip together your pizza, you don't need any magic. Just some good old pizza and dough mix and water for crust, some pesto mix for sauce, and we've added a little Parmesan cheese and olive oil to that, some goat cheese, some scallions, and then sun-dried tomatoes for the toppings. It'll take you about 15 minutes to put it together, about a half hour to bake, and then it's supper time. Trailside is brought to you in part by Chevy Trucks. Next time you're having fun outdoors, make sure Mother Nature has a good day, too. And L.L. Bean, providing sporting gear and apparel for people who love the outdoors for over 80 years. And High Tech Sports, who invite you to enjoy the great outdoors and follow the trail to adventure. <laughs>